This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. The NFL draft started pretty mild last night with the chalk hitting at picks one through four, and it kind of gave the impression of, okay, are we going to be in store for less craziness than we thought we might get? And suddenly the Atlanta Falcons pick Michael Penix Jr. pick eight, and everything breaks loose. And it wound up being a pretty fun night. What we're going to do for today is dive into what we saw last night, outline betting implications of it, taking a look at rookie of the year markets, trying to see if there's any value there. We'll dig into the Bears, their outlook this year, talk about the commanders, and then also those Falcons, and then some other teams that I like what they did, and maybe it's just confirmation bias, but they're enabling me to lean into uh, my worst tendencies for this offseason. So we'll talk about all that here, along with EPL Match Week 35 with Austin Cass and NASCAR and Dover later on. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research, here to talk about last night's NFL draft and let you know what it means from a betting perspective for this upcoming 2024 season, let you know if we find any bets we like over at FanDuel Sportsbook as of right now. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us. Just search for, search for Covering the Spread, hit subscribe, and if you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating as well. You can also find Covering the Spread on the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV Plus next week, big week, because... It's Kentucky Derby Week. Christina Blacker of FanDuel TV will be joining us, talking about her thoughts on the Derby with Post Draw on Saturday. We'll also get some Kentucky Oaks thoughts via Dubs Anderson. That's on Wednesday. So big Derby Week next week. Make sure you're subscribed to get all those shows as they go live. Let's begin things here by taking a look at the rookie of the year markets over at FanDuel Sportsbook, where no surprise, Caleb Williams is the favorite to be the NFL rookie of the year. He is plus 210, followed by Marvin Harrison Jr. at 6-1. to one. When I look at these initial numbers, I'm a bit surprised that Jaden Daniels is all the way down at 10-1, to one, given that if you're looking at a market like this, it's a voting-based market, and you can see it be influenced by highlights. And... Jaden Daniels may be a flawed player, but he's going to make some highlights via via his legs and via his arm too. Given that the commander's supporting cast isn't all that bad, still a chance to potentially add a tackle here in the second round tonight as well. So we're getting Jaden Daniels in what I think is a decent situation. And he's a guy who is going to grab national headlines with his flashy style of play. He's 10 to 1 right now at FanDuel Sportbook, the exact same odds as J.J. McCarthy. And I love McCarthy, as we talked about here on the show. Uh, his situation with the Vikings is the best of all the rookies by a good amount. So expectations should be high for McCarthy, but he's probably not going to be quite as flashy as Jaden Daniels, who's probably going to put up some pretty good numbers on the ground as well. So Caleb Williams is going to be great. He has a really good supporting cast, too, with those three receivers, Romadunze being there, decent offensive line. I like his coaching staff, honestly, too. So I get why Williams is plus 210, but the gap between him and Jaden Daniels at 10 to 1, I think is too large. So if I were placing one bet on this rookie of the year market, give me Jaden Daniels 10 to 1 at FanDuel Sportsbook as my favorite value after last night's draft in the offensive rookie of the year market. Do you want to take a look here at some uh, longer shots to see if there's anything else stood out? Uh, Xavier Worthy, 16-1, to 1, probably not getting there, despite the very fun match between him and the Chiefs. Like, honestly, I guess I guess I get why Roma Dunze is 21, given that he's competing with Keenan Allen and DJ Moore for targets. Uh, which is a, that's a fun team, but um, I get why he's there. I do think there's at least some value in Drake May. I'm not totally convinced he will start right away, given the Hadge Code Verset, and maybe they want to safeguard May from a pretty poor supporting cast, which they could address. You know, there have been some trade rumors about uh, the 49ers receivers. Maybe they wind up, one of them winds up in New England. They could get a tackle in the second round, too. So supporting cast could get better. Drake May also will have some highlight plays. So 25 to 1, at least somewhat interesting for him there. But I think for me, looking at the offensive rookie of the year market, I have a hard time deviating from Jaden Daniels. Again, 10 to 1 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Defensive rookie of the year, thought process for me was okay. I want to go to a player in a good situation with a good with a good coach 
who can play a flashy position and get you some of those like eye grabbing stats, like sacks interceptions. And the guy who came to mind is Dallas Turner. The problem is that Dallas Turner is plus 450. So they're very aware of that. We're not going to find value on Turner at that number. And honestly, I don't see a ton that stands out to me when it comes to uh, defensive rookie of the year. So probably going to wind up passing there. Maybe we get a a shift there at some point. Maybe someone else has a thought that I can lean into. But for right now, I'm not seeing much there. So we'll just go stick with Jaden Daniels as offensive rookie of the year, 10 to 1 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Do you want to take a look at the Bears quickly? Because again, like I said, that offense is going to be fun with DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, Kayla Williams, Roma Dunze. That's a fun offense, and it's reflected in the betting markets. The Bears, eight and a half is their win total right now. Over is minus 122. So that's a pretty big number. I'm not that far off. I have their win total at 8.2. And honestly, like I thought I'd be further off than that. So to me, it's a no play. And I see the upside here because you've got that offense. If Williams plays like he did at USC, which is very possible, uh, with the defense playing as well as it did down the stretch, they could wind up being a very good team. So I don't see value in the win total, but I also don't see value in the under. So it's a stay away from me in a positive sense. because so it is a lofty number, but I think that they justify those lofty expectations with the way things shake out there. So Bears eight and a half makes a lot of sense to me. Commanders, I'm a bit below market on. Their win total is six and a half. Uh, over is minus 115. I have them at six wins. I think part of that is um, their, uh, it's not really their their schedule because they actually are benefiting a bit from their schedule. They're 0.3 wins above expectation based on the teams they play. I did give a boost to them for Jaden Daniels, primarily in the rushing category, did bump up their, their passing efficiency as well, but not enough to get to this number. So for me, they wind up being a stay away as well. So if I want exposure to Jaden Daniels, which I do, uh, cause I think he's very fun. I'm going to go do so via the rookie of the year market where he is 10 to one. So those are the windows I want to check out other things I wanted to discuss. Let's talk about the NFC South because that's where things get pretty interesting, at least to me with the Falcons taking Michael Penix jr. Rather than improving their team in 2024. Like in theory, it does bump them up a hair because if Kirk Cousins can't go, Penix might have better expectations than Taylor Heineke, but it's not going to boost their win total very much. And honestly, they lose ground when you consider what they could have got at the eighth overall pick and the fact that other teams in this division did get better. So the Falcons minus 120 to win the NFC South. I think that's a bit rich still. We talked about that earlier on the show where I was intrigued by the saints. And the problem is the saints are enabling that thought by me by addressing their biggest issue and drafting a tackle in last night's draft. While the, the Falcons kind of more so spin their wheels towards the top. I also thought the, the Buccaneers got better last night. Their rushing offense has been absolutely hideous for, it feels like a decade at this point. So finally addressing the interior of the offensive line to me, it was important. Now, rushing efficiency, not as important as passing efficiency. Um, so it's not going to make a huge needle move, but they did move up more of my model than the Falcons did with the pe Penix selection. So when I look at the NFC South, I would love a no option on the Falcons to not win the NFC South because a minus 120, we'd probably get even money or so on them to not win the South. I would take that 10 times out of 10, not just based on the Penix selection, but also they didn't improve their defense last night. They're kind of just like, okay, in some other regions, they've got some flashy names, uh, but it's not the best supporting cast around Kirk Cousins either. So I would love a no option here uh, at even money on the Falcons to lose the NFC South. But as it stands right now, I think the Saints are a pretty good value plus 340, given that they did address their biggest issue. Uh, Garrett Carr was efficient last year, despite his flaws. Defense is still okay. Bucks. Not on the same level as those two teams, but you could consider them plus 290 as well. But to me, I think the Saints are a value of plus 340. I thought that before, so this is really just confirmation bias, but um, it did not hurt things last night to see the Saints address their biggest issue while the Falcons more so planned towards the future. So again, I think the Saints are a decent value at plus 340 to win the NFC South. I wish they had not enabled me on that front. Other area where I was enabled was in the AFC South, where I don't really want to bet against CJ Stroud. So 
not planning to do so. But I do want to find exposure to the Jags because I like them overall coming into this offseason under the assumption that Trevor Lawrence would improve this year, given full health, given stuff like that, uh, given health along the offensive line. So I wanted to buy into the Jags in general. Then they lost Calvin Ridley, and it's like, okay, it's a bit concerning because now your receiving core is Evan Ingram at tight end, Christian Kirk, Gabe Davis. I don't have the highest opinion of Gabe Davis as far as like a needle mover, so I was a bit concerned about that. But then you add Brian Thomas, who adds a lot of juice to this offense, and I find that pretty intriguing. Now, if I bet them plus 270, that forces me to bet against the Texans, which I, again, I don't really want to do just because I love CJ Stroud so much, but I think we can check out their win total uh, with the Jags. That was an eight and a half before, and it is still their eight and a half minus 110 on the over. I think there's a good amount of value there, given the Jags did address what I think was a pretty significant need at pass catcher in the draft. So Jags over eight and a half wins minus 110 gets me exposure to Trevor Lawrence, gets me exposure to what I think is a pretty decent offense without having to explicitly fade the Texans. I'll take that. So I was enabled last night via the draft uh, by the Saints making an improvement, the Falcons not making an improvement, and uh, the Jags solidifying their offense. So kind of wish that hadn't happened, but here we are, and I will be more than okay to confirm those prior. So those are the biggest takeaways for me from the NFL draft for last night. We're going to shift gears and talk some EPL with Austin Cass here in just one second. But first, if you want to watch all those rookies in action next year, you can do so via NFL Sunday Ticket NFL fans. Gear up! For the upcoming season with YouTube TV's best offer of the year. Save up to $215 when you bundle NFL Sunday ticket with YouTube TV. Catch every out-of-market Sunday afternoon game with NFL Sunday ticket along with every local and nationally televised game on over 100 plus live channels with YouTube TV. Don't miss out. Offer ends May 16th. Visit NFLSundayTicket.com today. NFLSundayTicket.com to get yourself signed up. Offer provided by YouTube TV. Up to $215 off, $170 off NFL Sunday ticket, plus $15 off your first three months of YouTube TV. Ends on May 16th, 11.59 p.m. Pacific. Excludes digital-only games, new users only, terms and embargoes apply, no refunds. Let's talk now about EPL Match Week 35 and bring on Austin Cass on to the show. Austin Cass, you can find on Twitter at Austin Cass. He is a senior editor for FanDuel Research. Austin, appreciate you uh, swinging by for today. Did you enjoy the draft last night? I did. Yeah, I was really excited. As a Colts fan, I couldn't believe they were going to get their first pick at Defender. And, you know, they chose the guy who retired already at one point in his career, but hopefully <laughs> it works out well. I mean, what could go wrong, right? Uh, but hey, he was yeah. the the number one overall defensive player, a uh, guy who, when he was healthy, played pretty well. I think it was also important that they're like, for him, I would consider it a big red flag if the Seahawks had passed on him, given that the Seahawks have a lot of knowledge of this guy, the parts of the Washington coaching staff are there and things like that. Like that might have been. Um, and they, they, I guess Jimmy Lake was uh, with, with the Falcons. So that was maybe a bit of a red flag. They decided to pass on him, but Leato Lato to UCLA, uh, no red flags for me, uh, given where he went in the draft. So glad you got your guy uh, there for the Colts. Yeah. Let's yeah, talk excited. about, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, I'm excited. I was mostly joking about that. I'm sure the Colts did their due diligence, obviously. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, I, I trust them. I trust them, but Hey, I, I understand given the Andrew Luck situation, why you might be a little bit, uh, the uh, the retirement word might make you a bit uncomfortable. I understand that. Understand that for sure. Let's talk here about EPL match week thirty five, and let's start things off with the key match of the weekend. That is Arsenal versus Tottenham. Arsenal minus one thirty five to win this match, despite being on the road. Obviously, a big match for them, but a big match for Tottenham too. So, any bets stand out for you in this one, Austin? Yeah. So this might be the best match of the season. The rest of the way, it should be really fun. Uh, Arsenal have a lot to play for. They basically need to win out probably to win the league. And Tottenham are trying to get fourth, but would also love to ruin Arsenal's season just the same way Everton did to their rivals, Liverpool, this midweek. But um, I really like the under three and a half goals for this game at minus 150. Uh, Tottenham's still an attack-minded team. We've talked a lot about how fun and high-scoring their matches are. 
but uh, and they haven't played for two weeks. So I think they're going to be rested, ready to go with the home crowd behind them. They'll probably come out of the gates with their hair on fire. But I'm on the under for two reasons. Tottenham have really slowed in attack lately, and Arsenal are as good as it gets defensively. Over their previous three games, Tottenham have just 3.3 expected goals per FB Refs XG model, and those came in games against Nottingham Forest, Newcastle, and West Ham. Newcastle and West Ham are two of the worst defensive teams in the league this season. Nottingham Forest are actually pretty solid defensively, but that doesn't bode well for Spurs, I think, against Arsenal. Arsenal's conceded only 24.0 expected goals through 34 matches. They've been incredible on the road, too giving up just 11.6 expected goals in 17 road fixtures. They have six clean sheets across their nine, last nine matches in all competitions. And in a pair of matches against Man City this season, Arsenal showed that they're willing to play without the ball and maybe sit back and be a little more defensive. And I think that's something they might do some in this match, especially early on. That worked wonders against City. Arsenal gave up just 1.5 expected goals over the two games with City and actually didn't give up a goal in either game. So holding City scoreless over 180 minutes is really a remarkable feat. So the uh, it's never fun to bet the under, but in a rivalry game, especially in a rivalry game where there's a ton on the line, including Arsenal's title hopes and Spurs Champions League chances, but under three and a half goals is where I end up. Deviating from the norm here, Austin, taking an under for a Newcastle match. Under three and a half goals, minus 150 for uh for sorry for Tottenham uh Tottenham versus Arsenal um pretty disappointed in that but hey value is value under three and a half goals minus 150 for this one now I'm wary are we gonna get us get a goal or assist prop later because I feel like you're you're deviating from typical Austin uh chaos here yeah we are gonna get a goal okay or prop later so. okay well I feel better about that then first though let's talk about uh, other traditional market bets across the other nine matches for match week 35 where else do you see value there Austin so the very first match of this weekend, Saturday morning, 7.30 Eastern time, Liverpool at West Ham. I'm a huge fan of Liverpool over two and a half goals. This is my favorite bet of the weekend. Um, Liverpool, everything's really falling apart for them. They lost at rival Everton, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, it's really been a nightmare a couple of weeks. So they're, they're basically out of the title race now. They've been knocked out of Europa League. They lost in the FA Cup quarterfinals. Basically anything that could go wrong has gone wrong for them in the past few weeks. But by expected goals, they've deserved a lot better. In the 2-0 loss at Everton, they actually won the XG battle 2.0 to 1.2 across their two Europa League games with Atalanta. In the disappointing home loss against Palace, Liverpool scored just one time from a combined 6.9 expected goals. So some of it's bad finishing and failing to convert chances, which has been a problem for them. But also a part of it is really bad luck. Uh, one goal from basically seven expected goals is really crazy. Uh, I think Liverpool are due for some positive regression in the goal department, and I also think they're going to take out some frustration on West Ham tomorrow. Uh, West Ham are <laughs> one of the worst defensive teams in the league. They've given up the third most XG in the Premier League, and they really don't have the defensive capability to cope with Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool scored three goals in the reverse fixture from 3.0 expected goals, which is nice when it works out like that. Um, so I think everything's pointing to Liverpool here for me, and I'm sure they're really not happy with the way the past couple of weeks has gone. So this is a prime get right spot for them, and I'm really happy to get this at plus 130. I actually thought it would be closer to even money. It has moved a bit. It's now down to plus 124, but still... Not that far off from 130. The implied odds at plus 124 are 44.6% versus 43.5% at plus 130. So I'm guessing that's still a value in your eyes, correct? Yeah, I, I would be willing to take this to like plus 110. Okay. And luckily you don't have to just yet, but plus 124 is where that stands right now for West Ham versus Liverpool. Liverpool over two and a half goals in that one. Okay, Austin, you promised us a goal or assist prop. Uh, what do you see in there? So the past two goal or assist props I've given, neither player has started in the game. So that's, that's probably a good thing to mention that we'll run into that a little more this time of year as teams have varying levels of motivation uh, and might rotate the squad a bit more. But yeah, I'm back on the side on this market and I'm looking at Burnley Manchester United's Saturday match and I'm backing Rasmus Hoyland to score or assist at minus 140. Uh, this matchup's a great one for Manchester United. Burnley have conceded the fourth most expected goals. They haven't kept a clean sheet since December 23rd. They've allowed 
and 2.1 expected goals in their past two road matches against teams in the top 10 of the table. Hoyland has eight goals and two assists in 20, 22 Premier League starts. He's played at least 89 minutes in five of the last six matches. And I think it helps his outlook that United have been so poor defensively because it forces their attack to keep pushing for goals. It's kind of that dream scenario. Sometimes you get in fantasy football where you have a quarterback or receiver and a good offense, but their defense sinks, so they're constantly having to try to score. So I think that applies for Hoyland right now. And I would wait for sure for United's starting lineup. That'll be out at 9 a.m. Eastern time. As long as Hoyland is in it, I'm going to take him to score assists. But like I said, I would advise waiting to see that lineup first. Yeah, like you said, check the lineup once it's out for Hoyland to make sure he is in there for this Man United versus Burnley match. But if he isn't there, we got a Malik Neighbors, Jaden Daniels at LSU situation where offense is cooking because they have to. Defense stinks. So they got to rev things up. But Hoyland minus 130 to score or assist in the Man United versus Burnley match. Again, uh, the recommendations from Austin. Under three and a half goals for Tottenham versus Arsenal, minus 150. Liverpool over two and a half goals at plus 124 against West Ham. And then Rasmus Hoyland to score assist, minus 130 for Man United versus Burnley. Austin Cass can be found on Twitter at Austin Cass. Check out his work at FanDuel Research, where he is a senior editor. Austin, appreciate the time. Uh, enjoy rounds two and three of the draft tonight. We'll talk to you again soon. I will. Thank you, Jim. Have a good weekend. All righty. Thank you. You as well. Again, find Austin on Twitter at Austin Katz. One final thing to wrap up the show for this week. That's going to be some NASCAR out in Dover. Pretty interesting race for this weekend because there aren't a lot of comparable tracks for Dover. So it's hard to be like, okay, driver X was fast at track Z. Therefore, I'll expect to be fast in Dover as well. So we're kind of working off incomplete data. But the data we do have has told me that Toyota is very fast this year. Chevy is too. They've got Kyle Larson is very good at Dover. Chase Elliott's good there. William Byron, Alex Bowman, guys like that. But when I look at my numbers, they say there is value in Toyota to win this race at plus 150 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. And I'm honestly pretty far off market here. I'm closer to 50% than the implied 40%. So... Maybe I'm way off, but it's because that Toyota has a lot of cracks at guys who could potentially win this race. My model loves Martin Truex Jr. and Denny Hamlin. That's a, that shouldn't be a surprise because Truex is a four-time winner in Dover. He won this race last year. Very good on concrete in general. Got Denny Hamlin, who hasn't had the same level of success here as Truex, but also has run well overall this year. A uh, couple races or a couple wins on somewhat shorter tracks in uh, Richmond. He also won Bristol, which is the closest comp to this track where Truex finished second in that race as well. So you get both those guys. I like Chris Rebell. Chris Rebell actually a bit of a value to me at FanDuel Sportsbook. He's 10 to one. I have him at 10% to win on the button. So you're getting those guys together. Tyler Reddick, a bit of a value for me too. Uh, he's down 18 to one at FanDuel Sportsbook. Still some value there, but it is a uh, shortening, obviously. So you're just getting a lot of cracks at guys who could potentially win this race via the Toyota to win at plus 150 market. So I feel pretty good about that personally, like a lot of what Toyota brings to the table, like what I've seen from them so far this year and what they did in Dover last year. So I'm going to go with Toyota to win plus 150 is where that number currently stands. I do see value in some of the Toyota individual outright markets, but I think I'd rather wait and bet those depending on what we see in practice and qualifying on Saturday. So for me right now, no individual outrights, but I do want exposure to another Toyota via the top 10 market. And that is Tyler Reddick at plus 105. And this is a bit of a bet on talent because when you look at concrete tracks and Dover's concrete, you see a lot of dirt racers do well there. Kyle Larson, very, very good here. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. spikes on concrete. Uh, Chris Rebell's been good here too. Reddick has a dirt racing background hasn't translated to a ton of success at Dover. Now, it's not a bad track for him. He has two top 10s here in five Cup Series races, one here in the Truck Series during his age 19 season. So he's had some success here, but it hasn't been a track where he's excelled. I think he will long-term because of his ability to adapt to a groove that shifts as the run goes along. I think that's a key characteristic that translates for dirt racers on concrete. And I think we'll see that for Redick eventually too. So Redick, Hasn't had the best track record here, but also is not actively bad. Getting him at plus 105. I do show value in the outright as mentioned, but 
better value here. I'm at 55% finished top 10, and he is at 48.8% implied right now. So we'll take Reddick plus 105 to finish top 10. Very receptive to adding an outright on him, depending on how things go in practice and qualifying. But uh, for now, we'll stick with just the top 10 at plus 105. Also monitoring Christopher Bell, uh, Truex, and Hamlin for outrights as well. The one non-Toyota bet for me right now is going to be Noah Gregson, top 10 at 5-1. to one. Gregson does have a good history on concrete, both in uh, the Xfinity Series and the Truck Series. Nearly won a race here back in, I think, 2018. He was leading for most of that race, but then uh, got caught by Johnny Sauter with a couple laps left, and Gregson wrecked himself trying to hold off Sauter, so it was his fault, but he's young. It kind of what you expect. But then two-time winner at Bristol in the Xfinity Series. Didn't run well at Bristol this year, but I think he had a tire issue pretty early on, which caused that. So we can write that off. And Gregson's been fast overall this year. Finished 12th in both Richmond and Phoenix. Those are very different tracks than when we get here with Dover. But it shows that his overall speed is good, as is the speed of Stuart Haas racing. So I'm buying into Gregson overall and buying into him specifically on a high bank track where he has shown he can have upside in the past. Five to one, the number on Gregson to finish inside the top 10. I have a good amount of value here as well. Uh, currently for me, Gregson is, I think, 25%, uh, 20, yeah, 26% to finish top 10. His implied odds are 17%. So I'm way off market on uh, Gregson here. Tiny bit of value in him to win 100 to one, not taking that personally, but, you know, worth throwing out there. Uh, but five to one for a top 10 for Gregson, I think that makes a lot of sense. So my top bets for NASCAR and Dover this week will go Noah Gregson top 10, five to one, Tyler Reddick top 10 plus 105 and Toyota to win at plus 105. That is all that we have here for today on covering the spread. Thank you once again to Austin Cass for singing Bry and talking about some EPL for this weekend. Find Austin on Twitter at Austin Cass. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonis. You can also follow FanDuel Research on Twitter at FanDuel Research. Don't forget, Big Kentucky Derby Week next week. Make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread, the FanDuel YouTube page, or FanDuel TV Plus to get those shows on Monday and Wednesday as they go live. want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets this weekend. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.